It's the Geo Show. 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 The G G Geo Show. The Geo Show. The Geo Show. The Geo Show. Go go. The Geo Show. The Geo Show. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Geo Show. I am, of course, your host and master of ceremonies, GOP. Today we have a very special guest, a good friend of mine coming on the show. He is John Hayes. Uh, Hello. He's, there he is. He's <laughs> uh, a bit of a film whiz. He's worked with 16 millimeters. Many would consider a bit of a dying art, but it's really still just beginning the possibilities of what can be done with the format. He's produced some really cool stuff and we're here to talk about it. Johnny, how are you? I'm doing all right. Thank you very much for having me, Gio. No problem at all. So uh, my first question is, how did you start working with film? Well, um, I would have never had the opportunity to use real film if it wasn't for um, the film program at my university. Um, everyone goes through sort of three core classes, intro, intermediate, and advanced. And as part of the intro class, you work on some digital stuff and some film stuff. And so... Um, uh, we did a couple projects with an old-fashioned Bolex wind-up clockwork camera, and uh, the first time they bought some film for us, and then later on we had to pay for the film. Um, but it was all through all through school, um, and I, I I always wanted to work on film, but I don't think I would have ever had had the courage to do it had it not been required of me. Um, now, when you started like getting into film, not just using film, but uh like filming in general, what would you say were some of your inspirations? Ooh, um, it's a little weird for me because I like to do, I mean, obviously I want to work in a, doing sort of live action and whatnot, but a lot of my inspirations actually come from animation. Um, some of my favorite films are uh, Toy Story was a huge inspiration to me as a kid. Um, Wally is another one of my favorites. Basically P Pixar in general. I really loved Pixar and Wally oh, yeah. has a really nice, has a really nice filmic look to it. They did a really, a lot of work trying to get that down. Um, and uh, also, <laughs> growing up, I was a big fan of Thomas the Tank Engine, and I sort of stayed being a fan of that for a bit longer than others. And, uh, that, <laughs> oh, yeah. That was all done on film, and uh, I just, I loved the look of that. Um, and I guess, I don't know, some other inspirations might, might have been Wallace and Gromit and claymation stuff. I, I got my start doing sort of claymation and animation and gradually transitioned into doing live action. That's very cool. I think what I love about those older shows is how expressive they were with, especially Wallace and Gromit. Yeah, and it was it was a great uh, thing to be impacted by. Um, you know, I, I think uh, sort of back then, especially with th something like claymation that takes so long and you have to be so careful that you don't ruin it, um, you know, stuff like that, it kind of, there, there was a lot more kind of effort and heart put into it it wasn't it wasn't as easy to say oh oh well just delete that clip and go again you know every every ounce of film and clay and everything was so precious and uh i think it, it really comes across in the final product which is one of the reasons i love actual film you have to you're basically burning money when you have an outtake so you have to really make sure what you're making is the top of your game with editing now, if you could just, if you get a frame, like a finger in the frame, it's just cut that out. But like with film, that's like the worst possible mistake you could ever make. When you're working with the format, what was the first kind of film that you've made? With 16 millimeter? Yes. Um, okay, so we were given the assignment to uh, go out for one class period, our class period was three hours long, go out for one class period with the Bolex camera and one roll of film, and we have to shoot something unedited, like beginning of the roll to the end of the roll. That's it. That's what we make. Um, and I was actually sort of well-equipped for that because I got my start um, working with Sony Hi8 tape as a kid. With my, I would film my toys and stuff, and uh, it never, ever occurred to me to back up the tape and tape over a mistake. So I record something, that's it, that's part of it. So I was, I was very used to this linear form of filmmaking. Um, and we, we storyboarded out this little story that was kind of my idea. Um, basically someone, our character has to walk down to CVS to pick up 
something. And uh, he, he goes through kind of a bad neighborhood that he's afraid of, and he's always looking over his shoulder, and he thinks that shadows are following him. And uh, so we went out with the camera, um, and it was raining. We all had our hoods on, and... Oh god, my backpack got soaked. I think I think that backpack was totally ruined by that. The camera, the camera was wet, but it was fine. Um, it was a resilient little piece of. I don't remember if it was from the 30s or the 50s, but you know, it was it, it was all very resilient equipment that held up well in the rain. Um, and actually, the rain was kind of nice because uh, because it was so overcast, all the lighting was really consistent everywhere, so we didn't have to we didn't have to be too careful about uh the lighting because it was just it was so consistent um but we did have to be it was always it, it was the first time i had ever shot something not knowing what it was going to look like because um when you i mean first of all you can't play it back right then and there but even looking through the viewfinder you're really not seeing what you're recording the viewfinder was very small and very dim and we just sort of had to have the confidence that we were getting what we thought we were um it was a little nerve wracking, but and it was cold. It was cold out, but it was to this day probably one of my favorite experiences making a film. Period. I had a great time doing that. How was the outcome of it? Um. So I will never forget seeing it for the first time, and I was amazed how how sharp it was and how clean it was. Because I imagined it was going to be like this this blurry, tiny thing with all sorts of grain and noise. It was beautiful. It was basically, I mean, I should have known. It was basically just half the size of 35 millimeter film, which is what they use for professional movies. So, but I, w I was just so blown away how, how beautiful it looked. And we, we nailed the exposure again, the overcast clouds help with that, but we nailed the exposure. The one thing that turned out kind of meh was something that I insisted on doing. Um, the camera had the option to change the frame rate. And if you make the frame rate run faster, it's going to capture more frames per second. So when you play it back, it's going to be in slow motion. Um, you know, everybody's iPhone these days, you can switch over to slow motion. But one of the things that you have to consider on film is that uh, how long is the film being exposed for? And if the film is going faster, you need to... Uh, you need to change the exposure. And we didn't quite get it right. That slow motion shot came out really dark. But... Oh, it was awesome. He, our character, like, like runs up and he jumps over like the tiniest pile of snow in the most overblown dramatic way. Oh, it was, <laughs> it was so funny. I, I, <laughs> I was, I was so I, as dark as it turned out. I was so proud of that shot. That's very cool. Was for the slow motion. How do you, with cameras like that? So was it specifically programmed into the camera, or was it? something that was like an external thing used uh it's basically programmed into the camera in a sense basically uh the camera uh, our, our camera was clockwork right you you wind it up with a lever and then you hit the record button and it basically runs until the, the spring runs out and the there was a little knob to control the frame rate and basically that would just control how fast the camera went um, and so for the for the majority of the time we were shooting at 24 frames per second, which is pretty standard. But um, for that shot, we jumped up and we were shooting at 60 frames per second. So 60, 60 frames of film were running by per second. But the thing is, the whole the rest of the roll was at 24, and the film projector was at 24. So when you project something that was recorded at 60 frames per second at a lower frame rate, it turns into slow motion. Very interesting to hear. Yeah, now, it was all it was all in camera. It was it was a totally totally natural effect. That's very cool. Now, besides that, were there any other difficulties with filming? Um well, so just the the ability that you couldn't or the lack of ability to see what you had just recorded, um, you know, me it was me and three other people in the group and we had all you know, growing up with video, we had all kind of gotten lulled into the security of being able to instantly look at what you had and, like, know if it was good or not. We did not have that security. We didn't know if the film was just going to turn out black. Like, we had done something totally wrong and it was just it was just ruined. We didn't know. And there's, there's no way to check. You can't look at the film because then it's going to expose to daylight and it's going to be ruined. Um, we, just, we just sort of had to have that security. Um... And I, and I guess the camera itself wasn't too ergonomic. Like I said, the viewfinder was really tiny, and it was in a bad spot. You kind of had to crush your nose to look through it, um, and it was it was a little heavy. 
Um, and we had a tripod, but we were moving so fast, we didn't really have a any time to use it so the whole thing is handheld and it's a little it's a little jerky but um i don't know but it, there was sort of um we did sort of run into a little bit of worry near the end um because uh, you know we were taking a lot of we were being very careful we wanted to make sure we get everything correct um but then we realized oh crap we're kind of running out of time uh bo- both <laughs> both class time and time on the film because the the film it's a hundred foot roll which is about two and a half minutes and we were we were we were really getting up there on the clock because the camera tells you how many feet you have left. So, um, but it, it was just it was it wasn't anything like really horrifically difficult. It was just kind of every everything was just sort of a balancing act t- to make sure that, in theory, we were getting what we wanted. Interesting. I think it's kind of like amazing how we've come that we're able to now. Re- well, what we have with I I sound like an old person kind of saying this, this speech, <laughs> Same. but it's it's amazing how when you look at back at this technology, it's like can't see anything, you know. And then with the technology now, it's like you can see everything, and you can even adjust before the photos taken. Like you can do the after effects live. Yeah, wow. it was a lot more primitive back then. Like I said, you know, you really had to you really had to know what you were doing and put put a lot of effort into it and there was there was a lot more a lot more rehearsal involved you know it wasn't just like okay one two three go and then you just see what happens you had to like really plan out what you were gonna do and you know we did we did an entire storyboard for this little film um we didn't he it's weird our professor required us to do a storyboard for this one but not for the more complicated one that we wound up doing that but. was that i assume that the more complicated one was done with uh, digital cameras no uh, that was another Bolex project, another film project. Uh, it was more, it was more complicated. So the first one we did, uh, it was one roll of film unedited. Whatever we recorded, start to finish, was the film. Uh, the the more complicated one was we had to uh, use our own money to buy several rolls of film and do a more complicated story and basically go out and shoot raw footage and then come back in and edit it just like you would normally, but you know, editing it on film by hand. You know, cutting and splicing it and then taping it all together you know yeah that that sounds yeah it's very odd that they wouldn't do the storyboarding for that was that a did you do a similar project to the last one was it the same kind of film or uh oh yeah it was the same kind of film both projects i probably should have said this both projects were black and white 16 millimeter black and white uh reversal film basically uh normally when you shoot for like a big motion picture you shoot with a negative film where if you were to look at the film all the colors are reversed so black is white and it's it's all inverted so that when you make a new print of the film it's positive color uh reversal film is film that you can just get developed and project it immediately you can project what was in the camera uh so both projects were done on on the black and white film um and it was it was sort of a similar process a lot of it was shot outside once again utilizing the lovely free lighting system in the sky known as the sun um (laughs) but it was a more complicated story there was more locations um the the weather wasn't any easier for me anyway um it was boiling hot outside and i the previous day had been cold so i dressed in layers but (laughs) I, i kept i just kept taking layers off all day and it was it was a long day too. We were out for several, several hours getting all kinds of footage. Again, still not knowing if it was any good. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, we've talked about this before in the past, but what's it like editing film? I've no, I know for a fact you've done it manually, no extra software. How, how's that like? How can you describe it to the viewers or the listeners right now? Yeah. So uh, basically. When you get your film back, so let's say we shot a scene on one roll of film, uh, that comes back as one piece. It's the, it's the roll of film, and every shot is part of that one piece. So kind of the first step is you sit down. Um, I have to give credit. Uh, me and some uh, another person from my group, Connor Murphy, um, edited the film together. I was sort of in charge of doing the actual physical act of putting it together and running the machine and he kept track of where all the footage was and so sort of the first step when you get the roll of film back you watch it you make sure it's all good and then you watch it a few more times and you kind of catalog what shots you have and 
uh, once you have that catalog of the footage, like on paper, just just like you know a simple sentence, like a, a, a numbered list with a sentence saying what each shot is. Once you have that, you then go about editing the film on paper. You make a detailed plan of what you are going to do. Um, and this this is common. This is how films were edited for years and years back when back when stuff was edited on videotape. That they would do this same thing. Um, you would do a paper edit, and then once we had that, uh, we would go in to the raw footage, and first we would go in and just cut out all of the shots so that they were separate pieces, and we would hang them up on little hooks that were in the editing station, so we had this big wall just full of pieces of film, all numbered. Um, and then it was just a matter of executing what we had specified we were going to do on paper, which is basically you go from one end of the film to the other, just taking all the pieces and putting them together in the right way. And uh, you put them together with this little piece of, uh, it's this little tool called the guillotine. And what it does is it has a, a blade on it. And with that blade, you cut, you lay the film down and it kind of locks it in place. And you bring the blade down and it, it cuts the film. It physically cuts it apart where you want to. Um, and then you can put two pieces of film together inside of it. And then you bring a piece of tape across where those two pieces come together and then you bring down this kind of pressure smushy thingy <laughs> and, it, and it, it pushes them it pushes the pieces of film together with the tape uh, and it, it cuts the holes through the tape so that it can go through the projector um, and you basically just assemble the whole film like that you cut pieces out with a little blade and you tape the shots together with little bits of clear tape um, and there's two sort of devices you can use to actually watch your film um, the more common device, the sort of thing that people would have had at home if you were like an amateur filmmaker in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, it's basically two hand cranks. So you have the, the reel of film on one side and then kind of the empty reel on the other side where the film is going to go and you hand crank them. And then in the middle, you have this like little tiny television screen, uh, that the film, basically the film runs through the bottom and there's a light and that light projects the film onto that tiny screen. Um, I don't like that at all because the film speed is dependent on how fast you operate it and you can barely see it on that little screen. Very fortunately, our school had an old fashioned, what's called a flatbed, uh, which is basically the film, uh, you basically have this big table and on it are these flat motorized, uh, like circular platters and you put the rolls of film on that. And it's it's like a, it's like a film projector turned on its side essentially, and uh, it has a much bigger screen, much easier to see, and it's motorized, and you can run it at normal speed. You can fast forward it. You can go really slow. Uh, it's, it's, it was just a much more it was a much easier way to do it. Um, if you look up like behind the scenes footage of like uh, there's some footage of George Lucas uh, playing a rough cut of Star Wars for people, and he's he's using a, a Steenbeck flatbed. We had we had a Steenbeck at school. Um, and it was just, it was so odd using that too, because it was like on my laptop, I have like Adobe Premiere and like, this is basically like the grandfather of that, this big giant humming <laughs> mechanical machine. Um, it's, I, I don't know. It was, it was so, I mean, I, what I'm describing sounds like a lot of effort just to put together a silly little, you know, comedy film about a guy who's on his desperate search for ice cream. Um, but and I think a lot of people got turned away by the complexity of this process, but I loved every minute of it. That Steenbeck was like my best friend. I loved coming in every night to sit down at that machine for three or four hours and slowly put together this this little film. That is very cool. How big, how, if you could describe it now, how big would you say one of those are? What, the, the, the editing flatbeds like a Steenbeck? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, I would say probably about maybe f f uh, f three or four feet wide and maybe two or three feet deep. You know, a, a decently sized table. And then it had it had essentially uh, something similar to the size of a laptop screen um, on it. So it was it was basically like having like a laptop screen on a desk with like film projector reels on the desk. Um, 
I think that's wow. about how big it was. And and it you know it, it was it was it's basically a desk that's purpose built. It has motors inside it, and it's perfect pur- pur- purpose built to um to help you edit film. Well, that is very interesting. Good little visual image. <laughs> but my next question is, what what's the future for your film making? What what do you plan to achieve next? Well, that's a big scary question there, Geo. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, well, it, w- would I ever plan to use film again? Absolutely. I, I really want to use film again. Um, I know <laughs> it's going to be hard convincing anyone else to do it. Um, I know there, there are people out there who love doing film and I, I just need to connect with those people. Um, but I, my future is definitely digital for now, um, making digital films. And I personally, I like to do character based things, you know, um, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of action or sci-fi or fantasy. I like I like kind of more simple character-based almost slice of life sort of things. Um I don't really know specifically where I'm going with that, but uh that's sort of the thing I want to do. I'm I'm kind of weird. I sort of want to bring back the family flick. You know, you just oh, you go to yeah. the theater and you see just kind of a nice a nice movie, a movie that makes you feel good. That's the kind of thing I want to make. Oh yeah, that would definitely be cool to see. Because I feel that there's not not really a death in that art, but I feel like there's, as of recent time, there's been more films that have been like dependent on action or not even dependent on the story. It's been like, a, oh, this guy's in the movie. You should see it because he's in it. And yeah. I remember with Green Book, the, the funniest thing was about that film is that a friend of mine... We, we were fans of this guy named Sebastian Maniscalco. He's this uh, comedian. And they're like, oh, we should go see this movie. And I said, really? Why? And he says, oh, this guy does a cameo in it. It's like, oh, we're not <laughs> seeing it for the film. It's like, that guy's going to be in it. So it must be good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm really picky about what movies I go to see. Like, I, I never saw... I think the, the only Oscar nominee I saw was Bohemian Rhapsody. Like, I, I see... You know, I, I hear like what my what my peers at school, like what their sort of watching habits are. And I realize I watch genuinely so few movies. Um, I sort of I, I, I might be a little bit too, too unwilling to try new things. I, I think that wouldn't necessarily be an incorrect statement about me. But um, I, I sort of like to kind of curate what I watch. And I, I kind of I like to really prioritize in terms of what I make and what I watch quality over quantity. Oh yeah. It's kind of kind of my ethos. Oh yeah, that's that's perfect because I find myself I've been drifting more towards TV series than movies in a way. Yeah. I don't know. I find like because the thing is with a TV with a movie you only got unless you're planning a sequel in advance, you only have like maybe an an hour and a half to 2 hours to tell a story with like a TV series you you plan you even after the first you start writing the first episode you plan for that series to go on for upwards to 26 to 52 episodes yeah. so you plan to have like a winding story with characters yeah. yeah i've been getting into that too um me and my roommate in college we uh we, we show each other films all the time we kind of we try to at least once a week have a movie night um when we when we started living together we were doing one every night um and we, we were showing each other a lot of movies and partially because i ran out of movies to show him and partially because uh just just what we like to watch we're we're watching less and less movies and more tv like um we're working our way through uh avatar the last airbender and cowboy bebop Wow, yeah. getting into the more modern stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, again, I always go back to animation. Kind of, I'm like, I'm like the most reluctant live action person. I should really just get into animation, but that's kind of difficult. <laughs> yeah, I find like the best animation is animation that was like produced by someone, like not by a co- well, sometimes by a company, but like produced by someone for like fun. Or to, like, tell a short story. Like, for example, some of the really early concept uh, Beavis and Butthead and uh, King of the Hill skits. Mm -hmm. I forget the creator's name slipped my mind, but all his Uh, first... Mike Judge. Yeah, exactly him. All his first films were literally sketches. 
Yeah. Well, not sketches. And it's almost amazing that that's some of some of his best content was like that early, really like not cheap, but that really gritty old stuff. So, yeah. Definitely. Uh, I, I, I try and do that too. Um, I like to, like I said, I prioritize quality over quantity. And I mean, the the way that you get good at doing something is you make a lot of mistakes. And sometimes I feel bad that I haven't made enough mistakes yet that I haven't, I haven't made enough films yet. But on the other hand, it's like, I don't, I don't want to make a film if I don't have a, a, a story to tell or some heart to put into it. Um, you know, when, when we made those little 16 millimeter films, I mean, t- technically, I had to make those, but I I really liked the little stories that we came up with, and I we, we weren't trying to say anything profound with them. It's just like, hey, here's some here's a couple silly scenarios, and um, and we had we had a lot of it wasn't there wasn't any pressure on us to make them particularly good. We just we just put our put our hearts into them, and I think I think they turned out pretty good for that. For lack of a better word, that's I think that's the mentality that all filmmakers should have. But I uh, think so, yeah. I guess we'll all stop, end it off here with that perfect insight. <laughs> I want to thank you, John, for this in, very interesting interview. If you'd like to see more episodes of the show, you can find us on YouTube. Our page is GOTV1, all word, G-I-O-T-V-1, one as in the number one. You can also find me on Twitter. I am at p-e-t-t-i underscore geo you can find news about the show and future broadcasts there as well as me so thank you for listening thank you john hayes for coming on the show and we'll be back with another episode next week the geo show geo show the geo show the geo show